salvation. Lord, how thankful we are for that glorious truth. Because, Lord, of your faithfulness, we can come, we can gather as the Ohana, the family, turning our hearts, our minds, and worship and praise toward you. Because, Lord, you alone are worthy. So, Lord, how we pray that by your Spirit you would continue to enable us to worship you through the study of your word. Lord, not that we would simply rise to some kind of intellectual ascent, though we want to learn more about you, but that, Lord, our lives would be transformed, that we would become more like you. So, Lord, help us, we pray. Teach us, we ask. In the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Please be seated. Amen and amen. Well, let's open our Bibles to John chapter 6, shall we? John chapter 6. We had mentioned that from verses 22 through 71, we have the discourse on the bread of life, where Jesus teaches the fact that he came down from heaven, that he is the true bread from heaven, and that he is the one that gives eternal life. And we mentioned that this discourse, this teaching, was really directed towards three groups. The first group involved the people. That was in verses 22 through 40. The second group involved the Jews in verses 41 through 59. And the third group involves the disciples in verses 60 through 71. And so far, we've looked at the first two groups, the people and the Jews. We saw the reaction of the people and the reaction of the Jews to the teaching that Jesus gave. Now the reaction of the people was simple. They were seeking Jesus. But unfortunately the reason they sought Jesus is because of the bread from Jesus. The physical bread that he fed them with. But Jesus told them it wasn't about physical bread, it was about spiritual bread because he is the true bread that came down from heaven that gives life to men. But we also looked at the reaction of the Jews, which of course involved two things. First of all, they murmured, and second, they quarreled. Uh, They murmured in the sense that Jesus said he came down from heaven, indicating that he was claiming to be God, speaking of his deity. But second, they quarreled. They quarreled over the fact that Jesus said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood if you want eternal life. Now, of course, Jesus was speaking metaphorically. He was not speaking literally. Uh, He was speaking figuratively, uh, you know, as it pertains to eating his flesh and blood, obviously. This brings us to the third and final group, and we want to look at the reaction of this group, and that, of course, involves the disciples. The reaction of the disciples. That's in verses 60 through 71. So uh, let's pick up our reading in John chapter 6, verse 60, reading down through verse 71 in our study today. John chapter 6, verse 60. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured about this, he said to them, does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascending uh, where he was before? (laughs) It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Well, then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? Well, then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, 
and one of you is a devil. Now he spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. So here we have the third reaction to the teaching on the bread of life. We've looked at the reaction of the people, the reaction of the Jews, and now the reaction of the disciples. The reaction of the disciples. Now the word disciple that's used in our text simply means a student, a learner, a pupil, one who follows a particular teaching. Now we follow the teachings of Jesus Christ. Thus we are his students. We are his pupils. We are his learners, if you will. And the reaction of the disciples to Jesus is seen in four ways if you're taking notes in our time together today. Four ways we see the reaction of the disciples. Number one, first of all, they murmured about Jesus. The first reaction is they murmured about Jesus. That's in verses 60 and 61. According to the middle of verse 61, it says his disciples murmured about this. Now this is the exact same reaction that the Jews had back in verse 41. In fact, it's the exact same Greek word that's used for murmuring. It means, it's only used eight times in the New Testament, by the way, it carries the idea of grumbling, griping, groaning, moaning, complaining in a low tone. In fact, it can carry the idea of complaining in and of yourself, secretly, we might say. In fact, in verse 61, it says Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured about this. So Jesus knew in himself that these disciples were murmuring, grumbling, griping, groaning, and complaining about the teaching on the bread of life, that Jesus came down from heaven, and you must eat his flesh and drink his blood to have eternal life. Now this, of course, speaks of the omniscience of Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus Christ knows everything about everyone all the time. And that should scare the far out of all of us. Because the truth is, you and I can hide what we do from our family and friends, because after all, they're pretty much knuckleheads. We even do a pretty good job of hiding our sins and our shortcomings from our bosses our employees, our employers, from our spouses. Look, we can do a pretty good job in hiding stuff from just about everybody, but we're not hiding anything from the Lord. God sees everything. He knows everything. In fact, in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10, God said, I, the Lord, search the reins of the heart and test the minds of men. Jesus said in Revelation 2.23, I am he who knows the hearts and the minds. Look, we're not fooling God. Which points to the importance of you and I putting everything out on the table. Coming clean with God. Because we're not hiding anything from him anyway. Hebrews 4.13 says there's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to him to whom we must give an account. It's that clarion call for each and every one of us to confess, to repent, to get right with God and not to be living in the shadows as it pertains to our actions, our attitudes and the words we speak, the places we go, the things we do because God sees all and he knows all. Well, let's take a look at the reason for their murmuring. The reason for their murmuring. Look at verse 60. Drop back to verse 60. It says, therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard or difficult saying, who can understand it? So when these disciples, these students, these pupils, these learners, heard the teaching of Jesus on the bread of life, that he came down from heaven, that he gave his flesh and blood for the sacrifice of sin for all of us, and how we must partake of that, we must believe in that, they said, man, this is a difficult teaching. Eating your flesh, drinking your blood. This is a hard thing. Who can understand it? Now, 
this becomes very interesting because according to verse 61, Jesus said, does this offend you? At the end of the verse, Jesus said, does this offend you? Now, clearly they were stumbled or offended by what Jesus said because the grammar is such that it really doesn't require an answer. Jesus is saying, look, I realize this does offend you. You are stumbled by the fact that I said you need to eat my blood or eat my flesh and drink my blood. But what I found interesting are the two words that are used here in verse 60, the word heard and the word understand are the exact same Greek words. They carry an idea of something external. We would say hearing something with our ears, listening to something that somebody said. Now the reason I think that's important is because according to verse 60, these guys are labeled as disciples. Learners, students, one who follows Jesus Christ. So presumably, they understood what they heard. Quite possibly, they had spiritual understanding from what they heard externally. In other words, they knew Jesus was speaking metaphorically, not literally. Spiritually, not physically. So the problem, listen carefully, the problem is not that they couldn't understand the teaching of Jesus. The problem is once they understood it, they wouldn't accept it. They wouldn't receive it. They didn't buy into it. They didn't believe in it. And boy, does that sound familiar. You know as well as I do, there are many so-called Christian groups today who take a portion of what Jesus says and then gets rid of the rest. They say, well, you know, I don't think Jesus really meant this when he said, thou shalt not, you follow me? Oh, they buy into some of the things Jesus taught, but the things they don't like, the things they don't agree with, the things that they don't think or feel or relevant to them, they tear out and disregard. They don't talk about it. They don't teach on it. In fact, they're not willing to accept it, even though they understand it. Why? Because they often say that, well, what Jesus said in this particular area was relevant for them 2,000 years ago, but man, things have changed. It's not really relevant for us today. We're at a, a different place in our society, in our culture and while it might have been good for them, it really doesn't apply to us. What? The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Read Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. He doesn't change. And it's sad, oftentimes we see churches today trying to change the Word of God and adapt it to the culture. In fact, I heard a pastor say that we need to change the message of the gospel in light of the culture. God help us all. Look, the culture doesn't change the message of the Word. The message of the Word is what should change the culture. It's the Word of God that touches hearts and changes lives. It's about a work of the Spirit from the inside which involves the totality of the Word of God. Therefore, it doesn't matter what we think or what we feel or what we believe or what popular opinion poll might proclaim or what laws are legislated in our land. The question is, what does the Bible say? The Bible's the final court of arbitration. What we think and what we feel is often based on what we eat. <laughs> Now, first service really understood that concept. You know, I'm at a point in my life where my two big decisions of the day is, number one, where am I going to eat lunch? And number two, what it's going to do to me after I eat it. <laughs> Don't laugh. It's going to happen to you. <laughs> 
So what do we base the decisions and the doctrines that we hold on? Well, we base it on the scriptures. We base it on the Bible. That's the final court of arbitration. That's the line of demarcation drawn in the sand. You and I, listen carefully, you and I shouldn't believe anything anybody tells us. Listen, don't believe a word anybody tells you, especially me. Amen, okay. We're to look to the Bible. We are to test everything. How? In light of the Word of God. That's what Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.21. He said to test all things and hold fast to that which is good, that which is true. We test it by the Word of God. Look, we're to be like those Bereans in Acts 17.11. We're to search the Scriptures daily to see whether what anybody is saying is true. Well, let's get back to John chapter 6. Let's come to the second reaction of the disciples. We said there were four. Uh, The first one is they murmured about Jesus. But number two, they walked away from Jesus. The second reaction of the disciples is they walked away from Jesus. Look at verses 62 through 66. Down in verse 66... Drop down to verse 66. It says, From that time many of his disciples went back, or literally to the back, and walked with him no more. So clearly these disciples walked with Jesus no more. They walked away from Jesus, we would say. Now this becomes very interesting because you must first be walking with Jesus to walk away from Jesus. And I got to tell you, this doesn't sit very well with a lot of scholars today because they say, well, you can't really walk away from Jesus. If you do, it means you were never really with Jesus. Oh, really? You know, Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 62, in Luke 9, 62, Jesus said, no one having put his hand to the plow And looking back is worthy or fit for the kingdom of God. So apparently people are plowing for the Lord. They're looking forward. But then they take their hands off the plow. They look back and walk away. Just as we see these disciples here. They're walking away from Jesus. You say, Clark, does that mean we can lose our salvation? No, it does not. We cannot lose our salvation like... Where's it at? I I misplaced it. I've lost it. Of course not. Does that mean somebody can take our salvation? No. We are secure in Christ. Make no mistake about it. We are eternally secure in Christ. In fact, Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 28, He said, I give them eternal life, and no man shall snatch them out of my hand. Paul was so confident of this very fact. He said in Romans chapter 8, in verses 38 and 39, he said, I am persuaded, I'm absolutely convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus my Lord. I am eternally secure in Christ, and there, their precious family is the key. My security eternally is in Jesus Christ personally. Is it no wonder Jesus said in John 15, 6, if you do not abide in me and I in you, you're going to be like that branch that's cut off, gathered, withered, thrown into the fire and burned. So while it's true, we can't lose it and no one can take it. Apparently it is true that we can freely walk away from it. Nobody can take it from me. I certainly can't lose it like where did it go. But apparently in and of myself, if I'm not abiding in Christ, the source of salvation, I can turn and walk away from Jesus Christ. And that speaks to the freedom we have, the free will that God has given each and every one of us. Now, note the reason for their walking away. 
Look at verse 62, the reason for their walking away. Back in verse 62 of John chapter 6, Jesus said, What then if you see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? Now, back at the end of verse 61, Jesus said, Does this offend you? The fact that I came down from heaven, does that offend you? Well, if you're offended or if it causes you to stumble because I said I came down from heaven, what's going to happen when you see me ascend into heaven? Boy, that's really going to burn you out. You follow me? Now, they, of course, didn't get this. So Jesus, in verse 63, clarifies. He says, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh, hey, it profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit. I'm speaking to you spiritually, metaphorically. And they are life. Now, back in verse 53, Jesus said to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Here, he says, the flesh profits nothing. In other words, I'm not really telling you to eat my physical flesh and drink my physical blood. I'm speaking metaphorically. I'm speaking spiritually. Because it is the Spirit that gives life. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's not about a physical event. It's not something you do. It's something you receive. How? By the Spirit according to verse 63. It's a work of God's Spirit. Now, the point here is simple. Everlasting life is a work of the Holy Spirit. How so, you ask? Well, according to John chapter 14, verse 17, Jesus gives us two aspects of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Two works of the Holy Spirit because he said in John 14 17 the Holy Spirit will be with you and the Holy Spirit will be in you so the first work of the Holy Spirit the first aspect of his ministry in our lives as it pertains to salvation is he's with us it's the word para it means alongside the Holy Spirit comes alongside of us if you will knocking on our heart's door, saying, hey, the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. In fact, in John 16, 8, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So prior to salvation, the Holy Spirit comes along our side, bringing us the information we need to make the decision to receive Christ. Now, Once we've received Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the second manifestation or work or ministry of the Holy Spirit kicks in. And that is the Holy Spirit dwells in us. He's no longer outside of us, alongside of us, but he is now dwelling inside of us. The moment we bow the knee, confess our sin, receive Christ as Lord and Savior, he then gives us his Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us. Romans 8, 11, Acts 5, 32, 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 2 Timothy 1, 14. We have the Spirit of the living God dwelling inside of us, sealing us for the day of redemption or salvation. Ephesians 1, 13, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 40. Man, we are sealed and saved because it is a work of of the Holy Spirit. Now, eternal life is not only a work of the Holy Spirit, but eternal life is a work, are you ready for this? Of the Father. Of the Father. Oh yes, look at verses 64 and 65. In verse 64, Jesus said, but there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. This, of course, speaks to the omniscience of Jesus Christ, as we've already talked about. And he said in verse 65, Therefore I have said to you that no one, no one, can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Boy, talk about the sovereignty of God as it pertains to salvation. Eternal life is a work of the Holy Spirit. And here in verse 65, eternal life is a work of the Father, a work of God himself. 
We saw this back in verses 37 through 40 in dealing with the people. We saw it in verse 44 in dealing with the Jews. And here in verse 65 in dealing with the disciples. And it points to and speaks of the sovereignty of God. That God does what he wants, to whom he wants, when he wants to do it too. Read Romans chapter 9. It really puts us all in our place. You know, oftentimes we like to question God. We say, God, why? Why is this happening? Or why is that happening? Paul, in Romans chapter 9, verse 20, he says, Indeed, O oh man, who are you to question God? <laughs> Will the thing form say to him who made him, Why have you made me thus? In other words, God, do you really know what you're doing? Now, we would never come out and say that because obviously that's a ridiculous statement to make. God knows what he's doing. But the question is, are we willing to accept it? Because God is sovereign. He can do what he wants, when he wants, to whom he wants to do it to. You say, Clark, and that even pertains to salvation? Oh, yes. Because God elects. God predestines. God chooses. The Bible's very clear. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible says that God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. In Romans chapter 8, verse 29, Paul said, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined. So clearly, God is sovereign. You say, well, Clark, how does that square with the free will of man? You've already talked about the fact we have a free will. Oh, that's true. Well, it squares beautifully, by the way. Because clearly, we have a responsibility as it pertains to salvation. Our responsibility is to believe by faith because we have a choice to make. In fact, in Joshua 24, 15, the Bible says, choose this day whom you will serve. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, in verse 19, Moses said, today I set before you life and death, therefore choose life. Clearly, we have a choice to make. And that points to and speaks of the free will of man as it pertains to the sovereignty of God. You say, Clark, I don't get it. Good. Because if you got it, you'd be God. You see, these are things you and I can't fully comprehend. We simply apprehend it because the Bible teaches it and we believe it. It's often been said that these are two parallel roads <laughs> that meet only in the mind of God because you and I don't have that capacity to fully comprehend who knows the mind of God? Who is his counselor? Well, certainly not us. Back to John chapter 6. Let's come to the third reaction of the disciples. We said there were four. Number one, they murmured about Jesus. Number two, they walked away from Jesus. And number three, and you're going to like this one, they believed in Jesus. The third reaction is they believed in Jesus. Look at verses 67 through 69. In verse 67, it says, Then Jesus said to the twelve, to these twelve disciples, Do you also want to go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Wow, I love that. Peter got it right. Peter hit the nail on the head. Peter understood and believed and knew that Jesus was the Christ, the Mashiach, the Messiah, the anointed one of God, the Son of the living God. And the reason that blesses me so much is because if Peter could get it, hey, there's hope for all of us. If Peter understood this, <laughs> you and I should be able to get it too, because Peter's one of the biggest knuckleheads in Scripture. You know what we're saying? But note carefully, class, in verse 67, Jesus speaking to these disciples, he said, do you also want to go away? Do you also want to walk away like those in verse 66? Now here he's given these disciples a choice, an option. 
to stay or to go. And once again, I think we see the free will of man in all of this. But the reason I think this becomes so interesting is because in looking at the free will that God has given to each and every one of us, I think it points to and speaks of his love for us. You see, if God didn't love us, he would force us to do the right thing. He would compel us to do what is right. But that's not love. Now, as much as I'm in favor of that, I would love nothing more than for God to force me to always do the right thing. To reach down and put his hand on my pointy little head and just turn me exactly in the direction he wants me to go. I would love nothing more than that. But you see, that's not love. That's a heavy-handed dictator, an overlord. God loves us so much, he's given us liberty, he's given us freedom. He's given us the ability to choose. He doesn't force us to love him. He desires for us to love him. Because when we do, that's the true relationship in love. Not because I have to, but because I want to. But note also, in verse 69, that Peter did make a mistake. Did you catch that? He said, and we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. All of us, we all have. Now, Jesus straightens him out in verse 70. He says, look, Pete, didn't I choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. So clearly not all of you believe. Follow me. So Peter did get one wrong. He should have just spoke for himself. He couldn't speak for anybody else as it pertains to believing in Jesus Christ. And I think this is significant. Because believing in Jesus and knowing that he's the son of the living God involves a personal decision. No one can make it for us. No one can say that, yes, you're saved because I said you are. <laughs> What? No, it's an individual we have to make personally. And unfortunately, there are many today who really don't get that. They think they're Christians because they were born in America. <laughs> are you kidding me? I was talking to a fellow in an airport and I was asking him about salvation. I said, hey, are you going to heaven? He said, yes, I am. I said, well, how do you know? He said, well, my grandfather's a Baptist preacher. See? <laughs> See, he thought he was grandfathered in. He thought he was going to heaven based on who he knew. And nothing can be further from the truth. Man, salvation is an individual decision that each and every one of us have to make on our own. Well, let's come to the fourth and final reaction of the disciples number four and finally the fourth and final reaction involves the betraying of Jesus the betraying of Jesus that's in verses 70 and 71 Jesus answered them and said hey did I not choose you the twelve and one of you is the devil Peter you can't speak for everybody and now of course according to verse 71 he spoke of Judas Iscariot the son of Simon for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. Now back at the end of verse 64, Jesus knew in his omniscience who would betray him. He knew it would be Judas. And yet, according to verse 70, Jesus chose Judas. Jesus chose him knowing full well that Judas would betray him. And that really points to the fact that God's in control of everything. The fact that God uses everything and everyone to accomplish his plan and his purpose. Here, he even uses the wicked, Simon P or Judas Iscariot, <laughs> not Peter. They'll edit that from the tape. Here, <laughs> 
Here Jesus chooses Judas Iscariot, who's being used by the devil to accomplish the plan of God for the redemption of mankind because he would betray Jesus and Jesus would subsequently die on the cross for the sins of all mankind. And I got to tell you, that blesses me to no end because it tells me that God is on the throne. God's in charge. Ephesians 1.11 says he's working everything according to the counsel of his will and he will even use the wicked to accomplish his plan in our lives personally, in our country, nationally. And I got to tell you, that should bless the socks off all our stinky little feet. As we look at the direction some of our lives have been taken in, <laughs> As we look at the direction our country's been going in since the early 60s with prayer being pulled out of school, this downward spiral of the spiritual climate of our nation, and we think, Lord, have you forgot about us? No, God's still in charge. And he's going to orchestrate everything according to his plan, whether we like it, agree with it or not. Now, that certainly doesn't mean we should be slothful. I think we should uh, make good laws. I think we should elect biblical leaders I think we should stand up and let our voice be heard we should let our vote be counted don't misunderstand we're not to put our heads in the sand and do nothing <laughs> talking to one of the kids in my Bible college class last Tuesday he said I'm not going to vote I said what what are you an idiot I go, look, we just need to vote biblical values. I don't care who the person is because it's not about the outside, it's about the inside, it's about the heart of man and only Christ can change the heart of man. And Jesus Christ will use everything and everyone to accomplish his plan just as he used Judas Iscariot the wicked. And that should bless all of us to no end because that means that God is on the throne. And what great peace and what great rest that should put on all of our hearts. So the reaction to Jesus' teaching on the bread of life, the reaction of the people, the reaction of the Jews, and here today, the reaction of the disciples. And I guess the question for all of us here is, what is your reaction to Jesus' teaching? How will you respond to what Jesus said? Because all of us have to respond. Because the truth of the matter is there's no neutrality in Christianity. There's no middle of the road when it pertains to Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, either you're for me or you're against me. Either you gather with me or you scatter abroad. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, he says, we can't serve two masters. We're going to love the one and hate the other or serve the one and despise the other. We cannot serve God and mammon. Look, we're on one side or the other. Either we're in or we're out. And I guess the question for all of us today is where are we? And as we bow our hearts and our heads before the Lord, this is a choice, a, a decision that must be made. Why? Because time is short. I'm not sure what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. <laughs> and maybe you're here today and you've never made that personal decision to receive Jesus as Lord. Maybe you thought because you were born into a Christian family or you live in a Christian neighborhood or community that somehow you're okay. Or maybe you, like some of these disciples, have walked away from the Lord. And you know it's time to get right with God. It's time to come back to Jesus Christ. Or maybe you're here today and you're not really sure if you have eternal life. Maybe you're not positive as to what exactly will happen to you if today were to be your last day on earth. No matter what the situation is or what the circumstances are, man, you can be guaranteed eternal life. And all you have to do is believe. 
You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is believe in Jesus Christ and receive Him as Lord and Savior. You can do it right where you're seated. And if you're here today and if you want to be guaranteed eternal life, if you want to know that you know that you know you're going to heaven, right where you're seated, you just let me pray for you. You just slip up your hand real quickly right where you're at, right where you're seated. Don't put it off another moment. Yes, dear, God bless you. God bless you, dear. Right where you're at. Man, this is not a decision you want to hold off on. Yes, God bless you. Yes, right over here. God bless you. Yes, dear. I see your hand. Yes, God bless you, ma'am. God bless you. Man, let today be that day. Maybe you're outside on the patio. Or maybe you're in the foyer, in the overflow room. Man, wherever you're at, let today be that day that you give your life to Jesus Christ real quickly, right where you're at. You just slip up your hand so I can pray for you. Yes, God bless you. Yes, right over there. God bless you. Yes, dear. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, young man. I see it. You can put it down now. God bless you. Now, before I pray for you, I'd like you to pray this prayer. You can pray it in your heart, but mean it from the bottom of your heart. Say, Jesus, today is the day I give my life to you. Today is the day I confess my sin. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to become my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with your spirit. Strengthen me with your might. That I would live my life to bring glory to you. And Lord, I too pray for my brothers and sisters, those who've said yes to you, those who've dedicated their life to you. Lord, I pray you would fill them to overflowing with your spirit. Lord, that you would strengthen their hearts and their hands for your service. That you would use them in a very real and practical way to be that light in a dark and dying world. So Lord, bless them, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand together? If you are here today and if you need prayer for anything at all, after the service, the pastors and brothers and sisters will be up front to pray with you, to pray for you, just to serve you, to love you, to minister to whatever need you may have in your lives today. They also have some information they'd like to freely put into your hands to get you started in your walk with the Lord. And how I pray that God would bless you, fill you with His Spirit, strengthen you with His might, encourage you, that He would use you in a very real and powerful way as you go forth in this new week, that your lives would bring glory to Him everywhere you go. God bless you guys. I love you. Have a, have a great week in the Lord.